Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're talking about arguments for the existence of God, and this time we'll discuss the argument from the proper function of the senses. In examining each of these arguments, I'll first be arranging the argument into a series of premises which lead to a conclusion, then explaining the reasons why each premise is true and why the conclusion follows from them. After that, I'll try to address possible logical objections to the argument, so here we go. The argument from the proper function of the senses. Premise 1. The proper function of our senses is to perceive reliable information. Premise 2. Unless our senses were created by someone intentionally, they can have no proper or improper function. Conclusion. Therefore, our senses were created by someone intentionally. Now, let's look a bit closer at the evidence for each premise and see if each is correct. Premise 1. We know from our experiences that this is the case. When a person loses the sight in one eye, we say the eye isn't working right. We go to the doctor for a broken leg because we know there's something wrong with it. It's not functioning properly. These statements would be literally false if there was no proper function to our eyes or legs or to our senses. Premise 2. Look at the difference between things that are created on purpose with an intended goal and things that are created by accident or without any intention of creating them. For example, if I walk by a cliff and accidentally knock a rock into the lake below, creating ripples in the lake, I've created ripples by accident. But those ripples don't have any proper or improper function. They're not the right size, nor the wrong shape, nor anything else of the sort, because I had no intention for them when I created them. Anything created by accident or without an intended goal is the same way. It doesn't have a proper function. If I decide to draw a picture, though, I have a goal in mind. I want my picture to look a certain way, and it either looks that way or it doesn't. If it does, I say it's fulfilled its proper function. If not, it's fallen short of fulfilling its proper function. We can see from this that properness with regards to functions is something which comes from the intentions of the one creating the thing. So we know that if our senses have proper functions, they also come from the intentions of the one creating them. There are no exceptions to this in the world around us. The only thing that premise 2 assumes is that intentions can only be had by someone, which seems to be obvious. If something is able to have intentions and make plans, they must be in some sense intelligent and therefore someone. Conclusion. Premise 1 implies that our senses have a proper function, and premise 2 explains that this can only be if our senses were created intentionally. Therefore, the conclusion follows. This seems like a good argument. What kinds of objections could be brought against it? Objection 1. Premise 1 is question begging because you assume that our senses have a proper function. Reply. You're only begging the question if your only reason for believing a premise is that you already believe the conclusion. In this case, I've stated independent reasons to believe both premises, so there's no question begging here. Objection 2. The first premise is just an example of the bandwagon fallacy, also known as argument ad populum, because you're just appealing to popular opinion to provide it. Reply. No, neither premise appeals to popular opinion. They just recognize certain things that are known to be true. The fact that human beings can confirm these premises en masse is evidence for the argument, not evidence of a fallacy. Objection 3. Premise 2 is an example of the false cause fallacy, because you assume that someone needs to cause our senses. Reply. Something is only guilty of a false cause fallacy when it refers to two factors which correspond to each other and assumes that one is the cause of the other. Premise 2 isn't a reference to two factors like this. This is just drawing a normal conclusion about causation from evidence. Therefore, it's not a false cause fallacy. Objection 4. Premise 2 commits the slippery slope fallacy by claiming that unless someone created our senses, they don't have any proper function. You then assume that they must have proper functions so that you can arrive at the conclusion you want. Reply. In every sound argument, premises have logical consequences which follow from them, and that's the case here. It's not a slippery slope to recognize that as part of an argument. 
a slippery slope would be if you rejected an alternative explanation because it didn't lead to the conclusion you wanted, or something of that sort. But here, the point about things having proper functions is a separate premise with its own evidence behind it, so it's not a slippery slope. Objection 5. Premise 2 is just personal incredulity, since you're only saying that you have a hard time seeing how something that isn't created intentionally could have a proper function. Your lack of understanding isn't a good argument. Reply. Premise 2 doesn't say that it's difficult to believe or understand how our senses could have a proper function without someone who plans that function out. It says that such a thing can't happen logically. There is no way for something that comes about without being designed to have a proper function. It can have things it's good at doing, but none of them would be proper or better for it to do. Objection 6. Both premises are loaded questions, since no matter what you say in reply to them, it makes you look silly. Reply. Well, to start with, it's impossible for either premise to be a loaded question, since neither of them is even a question at all. But secondly, it's not a loaded question to propose something that has logical implications. A loaded question would be if I asked you if you'd stopped beating your wife, or something similar, where any answer given would make you look guilty. This argument is just a normal, deductive argument. Objection 7. You're the one making both claims as premises, so the burden of proof rests on you. Reply. Right, and I presented evidence on behalf of each premise, so the conclusion follows. However, burden of proof doesn't mean that you're responsible for convincing the other person. Sometimes people won't be convinced, even by absolute proof. But that's not a weakness in the argument. Objection 8. Both premises are ambiguous and use the term proper function differently to arrive at an incorrect conclusion. Reply. In both premises, the words proper function are used to mean the same thing, correct function, the thing that should be done by the senses when they work correctly. No ambiguity here. Objection 9. Premise 2 commits the genetic fallacy by bringing the origins of our senses, and thus our beliefs, into the discussion. And the origins of our beliefs don't matter. You still need to prove your claim. Reply. Premise 2 doesn't commit the genetic fallacy because the genetic fallacy is about judging things correct or incorrect on the basis of where the claim originated. Premise 2 makes no reference to the claim's origins, only to the fact that if a certain claim is true, another related claim must also be true. Objection 10. The argument proposes that someone created our senses, but if you want to carry that through, you first need to prove that it's possible for someone to exist who can create senses. Reply. It's not necessary for every implication of the conclusion of an argument to be proven independently of the argument itself. If it were necessary to do that, there would be no point or benefit in forming logical arguments at all. However, logical arguments, deduction and induction, are clearly foundational methods of proof. So as long as the argument itself proves that our senses were created by someone, there's nothing wrong with concluding that the existence of that someone is possible. If it weren't possible, they wouldn't have existed and wouldn't have created our senses, yet they did, so it's possible. So it follows that our senses were created by someone intentionally, which is a good reason to believe that God exists. Next time... Why is there something instead of nothing? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.